Hi, my name's Phil Jump. I'm the Regional Minister for Baptist Churches in North Wales and in North West England. And this is one of our regular leaders updates. And, and while it's particularly aimed at the leaders of the 160 or so churches, that I have the privilege of serving and supporting. I'm all too aware that anything you put on the web can find its way to all kinds of people. So whoever you are and for whatever reason you are watching this, I just want to ask you a very simple question. How are you? You know, at the beginning of this season of lockdown, we were reminded to ask this question of each other with a bit more intentionality than we've often done in the past. In short, we were actually being asked to hang around for an answer. Well, this is just a video, so you can't answer that question to me. But maybe you do need to answer it to yourself and make sure that you are at least listening to your own answer. Are you OK? And if you're not OK, well, are you OK about not being OK? And who do you need to talk to? Who do you need to tell? Who do you need at least to be honest with? You know, at the outset of this COVID-19 crisis, we were hit by a tidal wave of questions and issues and concerns and expectations. And, and so what we tried to do was set out six priorities to try and give some shape and some structure to managing things going forward. And the second of those priorities right up there after looking after God's people is looking after yourself as a leader. You know, it's all too easy to be caught up in looking after everyone else and organising and sorting everything out for everybody. And then we start neglecting our own well-being. And that's why it's important that you deliberately just pause every so often and check yourself out. Are you OK? Are you looking after yourself? physically, spiritually, emotionally? Are you looking out for your family and your loved ones? Yes, of course, the life of your church will be hugely impacted by current events, but what about their impact on you? How are you coping with that? What support are you able to draw on? And don't brush that off and allow yourself to believe that that somehow doesn't matter, because it does matter. It matters for practical reasons, if, if nothing else. You are a leader. God's people will look to you for leadership. Your community may be looking to you for leadership and you will be supporting people through a catalogue of concerns and anxieties and traumas. So you're needed and you're needed to be in a place where you're able to offer people support. So it's important for that reason alone that you're looking after yourself. But it also matters because you matter to God. You don't need me to quote you all those Bible verses about being fearfully and wonderfully made, about being precious to God, about being loved by God. But you do need to remember that they're true. Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount about the wise and foolish builders. And one of them, whose house comes crashing down all around them, he compares to living a life that isn't founded on his words. Well, one dimension of the words of Jesus, which is no less foundational to be building on, are those words about your well-being, about who you are as a child of God. Uh, so yes, there is nothing selfish or unspiritual about building on a foundation of your own well-being. I know that Jesus says more than that, but human well-being is far from absent in his words your well-being matters to god and so it needs to matter to you and the simple reality too is that as a leader we are all examples you may not set out to be an example you may feel that there are far better people that, than you for other christians to take their bearing from but i'm not telling you that you should be an example i'm reminding you that it's an inevitable consequence of Christian leadership. So you need to model well-being for the sake of the well-being of those that God has entrusted to your care. And I want to think about that for a few moments through the words of Psalm 137. This is a psalm written by religious leaders. From what we can gather, they might well have been the key worship leaders and liturgists from the temple. And they had suddenly been dragged away from everything that was familiar, taken into exile and deposited somewhere on a riverbank near Babylon. 
by the rivers of Babylon. We sat and wept, they say, when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing to us one of the songs of Zion. Now stop and think about that for a minute. The waters of Babylon with poplar trees lining the riverbank. It sounds idyllic, doesn't it? But it was far from idyllic for those who wrote this psalm. And I think there's a bit of that's a bit of the psalm that we can often miss. It had the potential to serve as a wonderful place to be. On another day, a scene like that may well have inspired a psalm writer to pen you, lead me in green pastures and beside still waters. But it wasn't like that for these psalm writers, because their emotional state was anything but still and idyllic. And maybe we just need to capture that reality because sometimes we can appear to be surrounded by a wonderful scene or we can see others who seem to be surrounded by everything looking ever so rosy. But we don't always know what is going on inside. We don't always know how others are feeling and we don't always feel able to tell others how we are feeling. And it was not without good reason that these psalm writers were feeling the way that they did. They were in a strange place. They were defeated, taunted, bewildered and confused. So let's take a moment to think about what was going on for them and, and how they responded. The first thing that I think we can notice is that simple statement, there we wept. This was a place for them just to come to terms with their own reality and to release that sense of despair. But I also want us to notice where that led because it didn't really take them on a very mentally healthy journey now this psalm of course offers us great insight into the history and to the religious activity of god's people but it also offers us insight into what this was doing to them as individuals and it strikes me that the psalm writers are not really paying attention to their own mental well-being these people are worship leaders, they're scripture writers, they're the people to whom others looked to set the spiritual tone. But where do their thoughts lead them? To resentment, to bitterness, to anger, to revenge. Babylon, doomed to destruction. Blessed is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. You know, when I preach this psalm, I need to be careful and think carefully about where in the service I put this reading, because that's not a very healthy image. Blessed is the one who dashes your infants against the rocks. That's not a healthy image to leave hanging over a congregation while you get on with giving out the notices and taking up the collection. This was not a very healthy line of thought. Now, please don't mishear me. I unequivocally believe that this book, the Bible, is the word of God. But I do think that we sometimes elevate some of its narratives or the people in them to places that they were never intended to hold. This is God's word, God speaking. But God can and does often speak to us through the failings and shortcomings of our fellow human beings. And if we don't recognise that, we can end up trying to emulate people that we were never intended to emulate. And we have to hold a statement like that alongside the words of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the revenge seekers. The leaders of God's people were in a place of stress and uncertainty and their well-being depended on how they responded. And we can understand why they responded as they did. For one thing, they couldn't do the things they were used to doing. Their harps and lyres were told. The tools of their trade were hung up on those poplar trees. They engaged with God through the things that they did in God's service and they couldn't do those things anymore. The symbols of their identity were shattered. We wept, they say, when we remembered Zion. Zion served for them as a symbol of their own power and purpose. But they, they'd viewed God through the, the, the lens of their own success and they weren't successful anymore. And the cries of their captors mocked them. They were under pressure to conform to the expectations of others. And that just made their own struggle worse. 
And those of us called to leadership today can often feel hugely pressured by the expectations of other people, those we care for, or those conference speakers who tell us how to be successful. All the different people in our lives with their competing demands on our time and our energy. So there is so much about the situation for these psalm writers that reflects the situation that we might just find ourselves in at the moment. Because we might well be struggling to do the things that we're used to. Some of us might have adapted well to this new online scattered church technology, but not all of us. Some of us might well be really struggling. And for all of us, some aspects of what we do have been taken from us. And yes, it's all well and good organising our online service or our Facebook prayer meeting or our YouTube video. But what about when you can't be with the bereaved or sit face to face and pray with someone that we know are struggling? And I'm not saying these things to beat anybody up, but I think we can all be guilty sometimes of getting too attached to our role, to our environment, to our way of doing things. And it can be difficult enough to let go of that any time, but that can only get worse if those things have become out of perspective for us. And yeah, there's those expectations of others. <laughs> OK, in our case, it might not be our captors deliberately mocking us in the way that the Babylonians did to the Jerusalem psalm writers. But we can all too easily feel that the expectations of others are for us to dance to their tune. Or perhaps those voices are coming from within ourselves. We do feel quite literally taunted by our inability to do what we're used to doing or the pressure to carry on doing what we're doing. When perhaps recent circumstances might have caused us to ask some questions about that. Now, this is stuff that we need to work out for our own context. And my point here is simply to recognise the personal pressures that these kind of realities can generate and to encourage you to look after yourself and not to be too consumed by them. And it strikes me that this is what happened to the psalm writers. They become locked into trying to reclaim their past. If I forget you, Jerusalem, they say, may my right hand forget its skill, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. And I don't know whether you noticed it, but there's a subtle shift in the language of verses three and four, their captors say to them, sing us the songs of Zion or Jerusalem. And they ask, how can we sing the Lord's song? But instead of answering their own question, they let their attention focus on the expectations of their captors. Jerusalem was never intended to be their highest joy. God was intended to be their highest joy. And so instead of exploring their attachment to God in their present circumstances, they explore their attachment to all the things that they used to do, that used to keep them busy in God's name. And, and look where that leads them. And as their vision gets narrower and narrower, so their sense of resentment and anger grows and grows. And then they come up with God's solution on God's behalf, violent, brutal and vengeful. But you see, that's not the only story. Exile in Babylon might have forced the songs of Zion to come to an end. But many of the prophets whose oracles also belong in our scriptures had already been speaking on God's behalf about their big Jerusalem religious festivals. And it doesn't make for very comfortable reading. The prophet Isaiah talks about their temple festivals being meaningless, of being f God being fed up with their sacrifices because they've become so bound up in religious activity that they'd lost touch with the God in whose name it was being done and stopped seeking God's justice in their society. But yet when it comes to it, it's that religious activity that they hark back to. But this isn't the only narrative. The prophet Jeremiah says something very, very different. Come to terms with your new reality. Learn to find God there. Learn to trust God with your future. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry, have families, increase in number there. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city into which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, says Jeremiah, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. 
Now, I can't claim to be a 21st century version of the prophet Jeremiah. So I don't have all the answers to the whys and the wherefores of our present situation. But I do know this. This is a time to focus on God, not the things that we can or can't do for God. This is a time to learn to let go of what we need to let go of and to seek God's presence in our new reality. This is a time to really listen to God because something else that we learn from the narratives of the Old Testament is that coming back from exile was just as difficult for the people as going into exile was. And so, yeah, their journey back was just as challenging and mistake ridden as, as their journey there. So our current reality is not a fixed reality. There are yet more places to discover and we need more than ever to be in tune with God. And let's make sure that it's the Lord's song that we're singing and you're not simply dancing to the tune of other people's expectations. And there are all kinds of theological and missional and ecclesial reasons that you should do that. But I want to focus today on another reason. And that's because your well-being also depends on it. The writers of this psalm may have found some temporary release by venting their anger in the face of their enemies, but all of those negatives would have stayed with them. And perhaps they even sang these words in their own language as a kind of act of hidden defiance. But all it did was made their anger worse and made them wish things on others that just are not healthy to wish. But remember what Jeremiah says, your well-being depends upon the well-being of the place you're in. Find God in the reality of the present. Let your mind be renewed. Let the peace of God dwell in you richly. A peace that defies and does not depend on human understanding. Leave the understanding and the fathom into God. Discover God's peace. Learn to sing the Lord's song in this new, new land. But remember, that it just can't be the same old song that you brought with you from a previous existence. Look after yourself. Don't be afraid to weep if you need to, but follow the right narratives and seek God's presence at the heart of your struggles. So let me finish where I began. How are you? Listen to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God and listen to God. Not the voices around you, not the regrets that you've carried with you, but listen to God. Take care. Mm -hmm.